Hi everyone, I'm Gary Ryan from Organisations That Matter and it's an absolute delight to be here with you today for the Leadership Insight Series where we'll be talking about leadership, teamwork and high performance with our special guest Steve Monaghetti. Uh, I'll just do a brief introduction and we'll get into asking Steve some of the terrific questions that you've asked. Uh, with Organisations That Matter, which is my company, I work in the space of high performance where I help talented professionals, their teams and organisations move beyond being good. Lots of individuals, teams and organisations are good at what they do, but they're not as good as they could be. So we spend some time working with people to help them to be the best that they can be based on their talent that's available to them and their teams, of course. Um, today what we're going to be doing is spending a little brief time doing this introduction, uh, then we'll spend the vast majority of our time talking with Steve. Uh, we hope to have a little bit of time at the end in our 40 minutes for any questions that we haven't been able to filter through to Steve uh, from your registrations to uh, get asked and then we'll have a quick wrap up right at the very end. Now Steve Monaghetti, he really doesn't need any introduction but it would be incorrect of me not to do so. So let's just look at some of the, the, uh, the uh, Steve's uh, record if you like. He's represented Australia in athletics from 1988 to the year 2000. He's won both the Berlin uh, Marathon and the Tokyo Marathons in 1990 and 1994 respectively. And in 1990 it was actually the fastest marathon time for that year of 2 hours 8 minutes and 16 seconds. And Having a personal best time myself in the marathon of 3 hours and 48 minutes, which was in the heat of Alice Springs, I can assure you that uh, um, 2 hours, 8 minutes and 16 seconds is absolutely amazing time, as anyone would know. Uh, he has Commonwealth goals, got Games gold, silver and bronze medals. In 1997, he won the World Championship bronze medal. He has three top ten marathon finishes at the Olympic Games and did represent Australia at four Olympics, which is an amazing achievement in and of itself. Was the mayor of the 2006 Commonwealth Games Village and chef de mission in New Delhi. And he has, which is important also for our conversation, people to recognise that Steve has an engineering degree, a graduate diploma in education, as well as an honorary doctorate from the University of Ballarat. Welcome, Steve. Thanks, Gary. And most importantly, as we've just seen Excellent at the very bottom, at the very bottom there, you are also the father of four, which is probably on many levels your greatest achievement. Yes, I used to say. What did I used to say that I've got four kids and my wife has five because she looks after me? But <laughs> people were getting confused. They start start to think she was, you know, from a second marriage and all that sort of stuff. So I don't tell that joke anymore. <laughs> Proud of uh, four kids, a couple of teenagers, ones at university now, and wow. uh, one, a couple of other teenagers, and one our youngest daughter, Olivia's ten. Okay, so range still. So you've got tw low 20s down to 10 years of age, is that what I'm hearing? Correct, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Now, it, let's get started into it. Now, we can't ignore your running history, but obviously uh, the year 2000 is some time ago, and as we were discussing just pre the interview, you still do run, but a lot of what we really want to focus on today is uh, how you associate your experience as an elite athlete into the business world and, and personal success. But let's just start with um, some of the questions that some of the folk have asked. For example, mm -hmm. Jason's asked, is there anything that you did to overcome the pain your body experienced during a marathon? Yeah, and might I say at the outset some fantastic questions, so even mate, very thought-provoking for me, so I've enjoyed the experience of just reading those and analysing them. I think um, the pain, it's an interesting one. I, I tell people that I never experienced anything in a race that I hadn't faced in training or, or done in um, shorter races, so whilst the marathon, you know, you see it as a, a physical pain, it's really more the, um, the mental strength that you use to overcome that pain. So I'm telling a lot of people now, I mean, and you know you've been in this situation, Gary, and a lot of people listening will have been there as well. It's only 10 or 15 minutes of pain and at the end of the day, when you finish that, you look back and you think, oh, that wasn't that severe. It seems severe at the time, but you just, um, if you've got um, some spiritual will and mental strength, you know, you just think of other things, you think of the benefits at the end and you kind of do that balancing act of, right, it is painful, but the benefits that I get and the success and the enjoyment when you finish far outweigh the pain you're going through at the time. 
So the pain, the pain, which is generally shorter than people expect it to be, is actually worth the results that you get at the end. It is. It seems long at the time. It's a bit like slow motion. <laughs> but once it finishes, you look back and you think, oh, gee, you know, that wasn't that bad. And you almost forget about it. I know, you know, you hear that story of when you win races, it never seemed to hurt. But when you finish second or you have a bad run, it hurts for a long time because that's because your success and your euphoria of victory outweighs the pain you went through. So mm. that shows, you know, that mental strength's really beneficial. Now I will share that Jason who asked that question is an incomplete quadriplegic and he broke yeah. his neck uh, as a footballer when I was actually a coach of the, a local suburban football team. And as an incomplete quadriplegic, he's, he has ridden over 500 kilometres of the Tour de France as part of a tour. Um, he has swum at least eight uh, lawn Peter pubs and I know uh, this year in fact broke his own record by eight minutes even though he was still one of the last to, to leave the, the water and and last year in October in 2012 managed to climb 70 percent of the way to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. Um, yeah, well there you go you talk yeah. about mental strength I mean Jason you know, he's um, I'm sure he, he understands what we're talking about more than more than we do. That's right, now, and, and you know it was, it was interesting when I saw that question from him because I thought exactly that. I thought, golly, mate, you you understand the answer to that question quite possibly more than we do. Now, uh, along the lines of this mental toughness, still, um, when when you're mm -hmm. running and you fall behind, what goes through your mind and how do you react? And and there's the second part to that question, which is, how does that relate to your life now? Yeah, that, that's probably, and at the time I thought it made me just um, think back to a couple of races where I was, you know, in medal winning positions and and uh, hit the wall or got fatigued in my quads and started dropping back. I tell you, you reassess your goals pretty quickly, you know, I'm, I'm thinking Olympic gold medal, you know, um, you know um, fanfare when I get home, uh, financial <laughs> reward, sponsors happy, and suddenly I'm thinking, geez, oh my God, I just want to finish this event. Where's the next kilometre marker? So I think what you do do is it sits you on your bum, initially, yes. and you, obviously you're running and you can't, you know, you can't stop. You can't just sit in the gutter and say, well, that's it, I give up. So being in a public space sometimes, you, you know, you don't see the internalisation that's going on. So I reassess and I set little goals. Normally, little goals that you can actually achieve. Now, I know that sounds funny, but you say, oh, I'm just going to run up to the next kilometre mark, and you know you're going to get there, and you think, well, once I've achieved that, great. You know, So that's a positive um, message that you're sending. Whilst you've got all this negative stuff in your head, you then need to turn that around and get a positive message. So I get a really simple one early that you know you can achieve, and then you start building from that, and before you know it, you've obviously you know, you've moved through the, the bad time and you're starting to actually set um, goals that are a, a bit harder to achieve and you get a lot further along the journey than you thought. So you end up higher up, in, higher up in position. At the end of the day, I know it sounds bizarre, but having gone through that process, at the end of the race, you're actually more proud of your own effort because you had to sort of analyse and do this internalisation to actually get an outcome. It mm. didn't just happen naturally. When you win a race, it happens naturally. You don't even have to work hard. So you don't you don't think about all the process you go through. It just kind of unfolds nicely. But when it when you hit a, 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 a stumbling block yes. like that, it forces you to come up with other strategies. So in line with that, I'm I'm, I'm assuming that you set you had you'd go in with a race plan. And then yep. this would happen. You, you, you're, you're falling behind, so you have to. You, you've got to reassess. So I'd be interested to know, uh, with regards to your, your race plans, how, how often were they? You know, it actually the race went to the along with the plan, or you know, did they by and large vary according to the reality? Oh, they never went along with the plan, to be honest. <laughs> and what did my coach Chris Wardlaw and he? And when you talk about mentors, and I know a lot of the other um, questions that we'll get to yeah. sort of involve that, but. Um, we used to say we had no plan B, there was only plan A and, and whilst we joke and laugh about it, what that sort of meant interestingly was we've got plan A but let's be honest Steve, we know plan A is not going to work mm. so you go back, you don't have a set plan B, what you do is you just adapt. So yes. plan A is your, is your, you know, your rock solid, it's your plan but to be honest in life we set plans but you know they're not going to unfold like you wish. So what you do is you have your plan but then your real plan or your real strategy is when that plan doesn't work 
how you then bring in these little outside influences to, to get you back as close to the plan as you possibly can. I, I sort of like it, liken it to a marathon and you're running down a, a wide super highway and then you get distracted and you get taken off on a branch and it's rather than continue on that branch you actually then have to do, a, do some change up to get you back on the super highway or mm. get you back towards the super highway and you keep having those little diversions along the way and if you keep going on the diversion obviously you, you get way off track so you've got to have those strategies that get you back onto the highway that you want to be. So really that, that, that adaptation, the ability to, to adapt in the race so to speak is actually a skill that people need to develop over time to create the success that they desire in anything in life. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And it won't happen. You have to practice it and yes. that's again, you know, I practice it in training and you, you don't do it completely in training, but you do you take little steps so that when it happens, it's it, it, it actually happens in a right it doesn't happen any different, Gary. This is what people need to realise that the little steps you do in training or just little examples you do in life, when it actually happens in the public or in, or in a big decision, the actual the steps aren't any different, they're just bigger and, and more important. So you've got to understand that the essence of what you're going through is the same, it's just exaggerated because it's more public, it's in a bigger forum, mm. it's the Olympic Games or some environment like that, but the strategy itself still in, in its minor form, or its micro form is, is the really important part. And it just reinforces that point you've already made that you've never done anything in a race that you hadn't done in training, which includes the adaptations. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's also uh, whilst you know you're born with a lot of your makeup, I think it's it's the the fact that you develop it and, and you you acknowledge that development. You know, we talk about yeah, you know, we can talk all day, but you know, lifelong learning, all mm -hmm. those sort of phrases that people throw around. What does lifelong learn, learning mean? Well, to me, it's developing those little attributes that you have, recognizing them and then developing them and using strategies to maximise them. And you, you, need to, you need to have an awareness of that. You need to actually be consciously doing that. A lot of yeah. people just sort of think they do it or talk the talk and, and don't walk the walk, whereas in my circumstance, because and a lot of what I'm talking about, I, I look back now and realise I was doing it at the time. I wasn't as focused on it at the time, but my runnings allowed me to, to my success in runnings allowed me to realise that that's what I was doing. I just didn't know it at the time. Look, I'll just reinforce that. You just said that recognising and de developing your attributes. So we're all born with some special attributes. Our job in life is to work out what they are and consciously develop them. That's the message that I just heard you say. Have I captured that That's, accurately? And that is, that is a really important message that if, if people who are listening get that message, gee, we have had, we have had a very successful uh, conversation. Yeah, and, and that's not, and what that also means is that we can't do everything, but what we can do is do whatever's appropriate for whatever the attributes we are, and then the sky's the limit within, the, within whatever those attributes are, and so we're not sitting here and saying, oh, all of you fuck out here, you can, you can do, go and do whatever you like. Um, your attributes literally might not allow you, given, for example, I'm five foot seven. So being a, an MBL uh, or an NBA basketball, it was probably always going to be something that was going to be a bit of a stretch. Um, now, there may have been one or two over time. I'm not too sure at my height, but the realities were my, my attributes probably weren't going to help with that. Now, um, and... No, but interestingly, Gary, just on that, your attributes, what you do is you maximise your attributes, and if you happen to end up then someone else recognises that and selects you to play NBL, then that's an outcome. But you, you, your attributes got you to that outcome. Yes. By maximising those attributes, then the outcome looks after itself. Again, that, you know, I don't want to use that phrase. But, and, and I think one of the other questions, I don't want to jump around, but yeah. talking about introverts, I think that's, oh, I'm an introvert to be honest, I was a shy kid and, and um, still have you know some issues with that personally. But if you focus on the positive attributes that you've got. So recognise the positive. Lots of people will tell you what you can't do. Not many people will tell you what you can do. And you know more than anybody what your positive attributes are. So really pick those up. Even if there's only one, everyone has got positive attributes. So just pick one and really focus on um, um, working that to its maximum and developing that and that will overflow into other aspects of your life. Now I am a living breathing example of that having happened when I was at secondary school so mm. I, I, I'm, I'm really strong on that. 
Yeah, and I couldn't agree with you more about uh, the, your point about being an introvert. It doesn't stop you being a leader. No, that's correct. Because that's only... But again, I think you need to recognise we can... And I, I, I was sort of a bit embarrassed about it. You know, I was a shy kid. I didn't want to tell people <laughs> I was a bit shy and introverted. And, and as a runner on the public, um, on the public um, scene, I didn't mm. want to be think everyone saying oh, I'm a bit nervous and a bit shy. So you cover that. But I'm, I'm quite comfortable now saying that, that the, the fact is you've got to recognise it, and, and then you work with what you've got. You don't, you don't block it out. You just maximise the positive. Um, attributes out of that being introverted and it's part of your character but it isn't your whole makeup. Now talking about some positive attributes we have a number of folk who have joined us from Western Australia today which uh, it's only just gone a quarter past seven over in Western Australia and one of those folk Anne has asked does the sport metaphor still translate to the business world the younger generation and women? Yeah, I, I slightly differentiate between sports. Sports become a bit of an industry, and it depends what. Um, well, for me, to be honest, um, work and sport that that balance for me that there isn't much differentiation. What I do differentiate between is, um, and and um, Anne's question made me think about that is is recreation. So I now differentiate because I, I think sport has become so much. A, a part of our um, culture that it's almost become a, a you know an industry within itself. So mm. and, and can be a business. It can be you know, this professional sport. There's we're all we've all got a, a, a bloody comment on on a sporting situation because it's so um, heavily scrutinised in the media. So I actually separate sport and I break it up into um, what I call recreation, which is a completely distinct area and I think a really important part of life at the moment because we are so busy and mm. so overcome with technology that I think recreation as opposed to sport is, is something that we need to, to think about and focus on. Our own recreation is really important in, um, in our life at the moment. I'll just, uh, I, I know uh, Anne does a lot of work uh, in helping people with their mentoring programs. I might just see if her microphone's available. Anne, are you there with us? Just checking. Just give you one more moment, and if you can, if your microphone's working. Okay, I can't. We're not hearing Anne at the moment, so I just thought we might have picked up a comment from her if there was. Um, now, we've also got Malcolm, who's actually also in Western Australia, who's asked, what's the one characteristic that you see in people that tells you that they are an achiever slash winner? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I look at different attributes. I don't know if anyone would say this one, but... Um, mm -hmm. Paying attention and um, being able to focus on a task. So I actually look at. Uh, I, I probably um, I meet lots and lots of people, mm. and I, I probably look to that as being a really important attribute to someone who will really engage with me in a um, in a conversation. So not just talking about themselves, not getting distracted, not being on their you know tweeting or doing something on their phone, but is really engaged. In a in a conversation, but then also can can show me that they've got some um, concrete learning out of that. That whilst you know we're chatting and they're really focused on our conversation, they then provide some good outcomes or some challenges to me in the conversation. It shows to me that they've they've absorbed it, they've listened, they've absorbed it, but they've also um, thought a bit deeper, they've gone to the next level of the conversation and set me some challenges or, or really um, allowed them, their own mind, to work at a different level. Well, that's fascinating because interestingly to me those attributes sound aligned with being an introvert. They're right, all, okay. They're, they're, well, I mean, they're, they're, that's they're, probably they're, why I relate to them. <laughs> that may, may be. I mean, they're, they're natural preferences to, for, for introverts to be able to pay attention and to be able to focus. I mean, they're, they're attributes that come with introversion. Um, right. And, and, and I then, just think I'm really big on communication at the moment, and I think we've probably we've, we've got a bit lost in, to, the, to the art of true communication with the listening and, and actioning your listening rather than we, we sort of we've become so reliant on using communication and media for other people to do the do the do for us. We almost sort of take the information on board and then select someone else to do the task that 
we've <laughs> chosen to um, do rather than do it ourselves. So I like to think that a person can can be a bit multi-skilled, can analyse the situation and then act on it using their own capabilities rather than relying on someone external to do it for them. Yes. Maybe that's why I'm a marathon runner. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, but uh, I mean, we're, we're all more than one, uh, one one small set of attributes. But by the way, um, I, I assume you may know this, but our audience might not, that the research clearly indicates that introverts can behave more like extroverts than extroverts can behave like introverts. Um, right, yeah, 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 no surprises yeah, there. That, there's no surprises there. Now, um, Jock asks, how do you determine that performance is high? Yeah, oh, it depends. I, I, in my own situation, I and I've been able to probably translate a little bit from my running, but I look it up. My, I set my own personal goal, so I don't know. Um, you can analyse it against benchmarks set by other people, but I would always go into a situation where I would set my own performance levels. So I don't, I don't know how anyone could measure what's high, medium or low unless they've set the benchmarks themselves. Now then you then compare that to external benchmarks. So so what I would do in it without using um, running as an example, but I would say, okay, a good result in this race is say a time that I'm setting myself. Now if that happens to allow me to if I achieve that time but I finish fifth in the race, then I have to actually go, okay, maybe my my personal performance levels aren't realistic to public because I didn't win the race. So then I have to reassess them. I go, okay, I might need to think, look at my own um, performance levels and adjust them to suit um, what's happening publicly. Because some people will do it the other way around. They'll they'll go, well, gee, what's the winner of the race or the best in the world doing? I think that's a really hard position to start from because you're probably going to be severely disappointed if you start at such a high level. So I work the other way. I go set your own benchmarks and see where that sits you and then reassess those because you can actually control your own benchmarks. You can't control what other people are doing. So I kind of start with it with your own, look to what how that sits in the, in the scheme of things uh, generally within the workplace or, or within your competitive environment and then reassess that being able to control um, the situation uh, that you're in. So that, let's just talk a little bit longer, Steve, about that in relation to yep. the workplace. Um, yep. So a, a team, because we, we tend to work in teams these days, most mostly, yep. um, so a team would sit down and, and look at each other in the eye and say, look, based on the talent we've got around this table or whatever it is, this is what we think we can do. Then go externally to see what's going on and, and um, compare and adjust if necessary, but actually start with the folk around the table saying, let's have a look and, uh, and ourselves assess the talent that we've got as it relates to whatever goal we're trying to achieve, um, or we're setting the goals according to the talent that we've gotten. Now, I, I know from my experience, I reckon a lot of teams don't do that step. They actually don't sit around and have a conversation about how talented are we? And if we haven't got yeah. the talents that we and reckon, I, go on. I think the the thing, and I, I, I've never really thought of it like this, but it came to me, you, everyone knows this, and I'm thinking it's so obvious, how, how come I couldn't have ever imagined this, but this question sparked in my mind, the fact that when those people are sitting around in the room, if the collective outcome is not greater than all the individuals, then you're doing something wrong, because that's what a team is. I've worked that out, a team is now, whoops, someone wants me. <laughs> um, so I worked out that that's what a team is. Go away. Uh, what a team is is actually that getting a group of people together, and the outcome of having all those people together is greater than the sum of the individuals. Otherwise, you might as well just have the individuals all working independently, and then the out, you know the individual outcomes is greater than the team outcome. So that's what a team is. So if you can't do as you, I'm just reinforcing what you're saying, Gary. If you sit around and you don't get a greater outcome than the individuals would have done by themselves, then you have it. Why go to the next step? Because that is the first step. If you can't get that step, then there's no point in looking externally because you're not doing the in-house stuff to, to get the benefit. So externally, you are going to get blown away because internally, you haven't got the, the right um, outcomes as it is. 
Now, uh, uh, feeding on from this part of the conversation, Dennis, who is in the United States of America in Florida, has asked that obviously marathon running appears as in, as in individual a sport as there could be. How important was your support to you and in what ways? And probably how might we relate that to yeah. your life post-elite sport? Yeah, and this is, this is, I don't have a problem with this because whilst I do the public running, you know what? what's really important about having a support group. And I don't like the word support because support, it's like they're propping me up. Mm. And I don't like that from, it, from its um, um, innate suggestion. What I, what I refer to is having a group of people around you with specific talent. So I, I, I get injured. I can't fix my injury, so I need a, a, the best physio I can get. And I had the best physio. I had the best coach and I had the best um, support crew, you know, getting my food ready. And what, what all that does, so they're not, they're not propping me up. They are specifically doing the thing that they are very good at, which is an integral part of the group that gets together to allow me to achieve the outcome. I, I'm one person, but I need that group of people to work with me to maximise the outcome from, from my run results. So whilst I've got the ability, I do the running, all of those components need to combine to get one united outcome. And you know the most important thing is it allows me to focus on one thing. Yes. Go in a race and run. And that is all I need to focus on. I don't need the distractions of all these. Imagine I'm halfway through a race and I think, oh God, my dog's at the vet. I wonder if the dog's died, I had to put, I mean, that, that type of thought process halfway through an Olympic marathon is something that will affect the outcome of my result. So I need to have a support person who looks, that's my wife, who looks after that aspect of the family. And I know when I stand on the start line, all of those people who have done their roles um, in, in uh, preparation have allowed me to just be 100% focused on the task that I've got, and that is to run a marathon to the best of my ability. There are enough variables that will happen in the race. I want to make sure that I can deal with those without having the distractions of other mm. things on my mind. Well, there's two, there's two components to this. Uh, Dennis has uh, also asked, um, what word would you prefer to use rather than support? And and it might not be a single word, by the way. And and he, what is what that part of your conversation is reflecting is I teach people a lot about mental models, and our mental models are our theories about how the world works, and our language often reflects our mental models. So yeah. you've you've just said that mental model of the word support doesn't work for me. That theory doesn't work because I don't see it that way. So I suppose what language would you use that does that fit with your theory of how it does hang together? God, I don't know about, well, what am I trying to, is there something, who am I? Am I the field marshal and then I have all my, <laughs> my um, corporals and sergeants around that, that are, are more focused on their, their abilities? I don't, and I don't like, I'm trying to think that's, that's kind of more of what I'm, I think, as I say, I've got no, no comprehension of war or what that involves, but I, I seem to think I'm kind of the, the central hub and these um, pods that I need to allow my central hub to um, work best. So I, I allow those pods to work in isolation knowing that they are the best person to deal with that area. Well, you know, I'd wonder if the word you're looking for is your routine and that it just happened to be that the team was focused on optimising your talents. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. I think we're, we're a team of a team of experts who are all um, working towards achieving a, a um, uh, the same goal. Yeah. An ultimate goal that we all understand. It just happens to be that you're the one. Now, there's folk out there in the corporate world who would be working working with highly talented individuals, and that the people in the team, their job is to use their talents to help that individual be the one that actually gets the, on the surface, be the one that gets the results. But ultimately, that person can't get the results without the rest of the team using their talents to help that person optimise their specific talent. So I know uh, sometimes in the science world and the research world, you have absolutely, you have absolute guns when it comes to people that, that, that uh, know their particular space 
and they need a team of people around them to help them optimise that, which actually creates the results that everyone's working together to, to achieve. Now, similarly, Jim... Yeah, and I think, just extending on that, Gary, I think sometimes um, those field experts have to actually compromise their efforts for the benefit of the team. They can be so good at their task that if they were to, to really push their case, they could overrun the actual outcome oh, yes. in just their specific field. So they've almost got to, um, and that's where communication and, and understanding of the ultimate goal is really important because they, they may in situations need to pull back because if they, they have so much input, they might, they might dominate and, and reduce the, the actual team benefit to achieving that ultimate goal. Now, I know that sounds a contradiction in terms, but that's a real um, gut feel, a real um, understanding of the ultimate goal that's important for the team. And that, that actually ties back into your previous comments about lifelong learning and recognising and developing your own attributes, but you've also got to, and, and consciously developing them, which is what we said earlier, but you also need to be self-aware enough to know when that strength has become a weakness for the team if you're utilising it yeah. too far, which is what you've just described. And that, now. Maybe that extends on... I'm not sure. I can't remember. Was it Brian who was who was asking us about what's that? What's a really important attribute? I think that's you. You probably hit it on the head. I think self-awareness is a is a. I reckon it's another level of of learning. And yes, and we probably don't. Rec it's hard. I don't know how you measure it. And it's. I don't know. I don't like using that gut feel or you know summing up a situation. But it, it's. I reckon it's an extended. It's another level of another layer. Of, um, of learning if you can get to that stage. Well, how do you measure it? Um, I can tell you one thing from my experience in working with teams, Steve, is your teammates know how self-aware you are. Yeah, you, how you know, do they know? Well, they just, I don't know how they know, but they, they know. They just know, don't they? <laughs> they just know. I mean, they can tell yeah. you. And, and so if you've got the courage and you've got the communication open enough where you can have those tough conversations, if you like, where you're actually giving each other feedback along those lines, then you know, that's the quickest way to know is to literally ask your teammates, how self-aware you, how, how self am I? And they'll, they'll tell you. Yeah. I mean, there's research like Jahari's window and things like that that, 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 that help with things like that as well. Now, um, in, in terms of uh, your your motivation. Oh, sorry, actually, we'll, we'll go to Elise because Elise is in Canada and has joined us from Canada. And she's asked, what is one of the biggest challenges that you have had to face in your leadership career today? Which is a lovely question. And how did you approach that challenge? Yeah, um, I think um, my, my greatest challenge is um, recognising that leadership is not about, it's not a popularity vote. And often to be elected a leader, especially in my circumstance, because it, often it's on more on reputation than, than deserved, if, that, if you know what I mean. I think yes. you know, my name gets me a lot of positions rather than my experience in that particular field. So the, the most difficult thing for me was then popular people have voted me into that leadership position. And then I, I say, oh, well, gee, I, you know, I want to keep everyone happy. Now they voted me into that leadership position. It was very quickly to realise that it's not about being popular. It's mm -hmm. that you need to then take that position and make some decisions, show clear and open um, communication so people know where mm -hmm. they stand. So to be fair but firm. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that might not make you popular but it will make you a better leader. And so, I mean, it's, it is one of the roles of leaders is to make decisions. And as you've said, you can communicate. And you can communicate, this is the reason why I've, I've made the decision. This is what, you know, I've taken in and listened. You know, part of the challenge is, is that sometimes the team members will think that a leader didn't listen because they didn't do what they wanted them to do. But the leader did listen. But if the leader's not clear in how they're communicating back as to why they're making the decisions they're making, which must always relate back to the ultimate goal that the team's agreed it's working towards. Um, some people absolutely aren't going to like you and they're going to think you don't listen, but that's part of the deal. And, and, and you know, the issue of being respected versus liked is an important one on this and topic. I, 
you know, I made two mistakes in Delhi. I'm happy to, to yes. go on the public record about that in my job as chef de mission. No one will know. These I don't need to tell you the exact situations, but in both cases they were because um, firstly it was an accident that um, a person had missed, missed a, a briefing, so um, communication hadn't happened. The second mistake I made was assuming something and in hindsight I look back now and, and I'd overlooked that and hadn't communicated that um, problem to the person involved and so the two mistakes I made were because of my uh, failure to communicate properly. Okay. You know, and that's their great lessons and, and probably many leadership uh, challenges come from that communication issue. Keeping in mind that, that leaders also got to not beat themselves up because other people um, choose not to develop their communication skills. So a lot of the time it is about the data. So, okay, um, with the one where I had, I'd made an assumption about what someone else knew, did I only have one way whether they would have found that out? Yeah, that, that one way was one single briefing. There was no other communication channel or tool that I used. Uh, I, prob I probably need to learn from that and have multiple channels of communication for important messages. So it's not just a briefing. It might be a, a memo or an email or it might be a text message or something goes on a social media site or whatever it has to be so that there's multiple ways and chances and maybe I needed to have three briefings instead of one, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as, as ways of trying to do that. Um, Don't make assumptions, probably as well. Make sure you cover your base and, and um, really, really ad nauseum probably in communication. I don't think enough open communication. There's never enough open communication. Too much communication is not a bad thing. Well, it is interesting with uh, with assumptions and, and, um, and I know it just was an off the cuff remark there about don't make assumptions, but the neuroscientists have shown us that as humans we actually can't not make assumptions. The issue is are we aware of the assumptions we're, we're making and are we then acting on them? So. Often we will have to act on assumptions as leaders because we just can't access all of the data, but the difference is that we're consciously making that decision versus doing it reactively uh, and not consciously right. doing it, which comes back to the, com uh, uh, the conscious stuff you were talking about learning earlier. Um, it's one of the things I, pro I promised myself I wouldn't make assumptions. I, I'm assuming that I, I probably don't, I don't <laughs> say them out loud. I think I probably still make them, but I'm not as, um, I'm not using my conversation as much. Yeah, and it's really about the taking action based on assumptions. That's the, that's the, that's really the issue. And um, you know, as humans, we, we do have to make assumptions. Um, and we made assumptions based on our our um, evolution because we sort of had to know whether that object in the distance was a lion. It was if if I got within a hundred meters, it'd probably get me and bite my head off. Um, so it's actually a protection tool and one of the challenges is that we have these assumptions to protect us but in the office world and the business world we don't really have lines running around the, the corridors so we do tend to um, make a lot of assumptions that are really based on very limited and often false data um, and that's why we, again yeah. comes back to that self-awareness and being aware of these things. Um, Frank's interested yeah. to know, you know what strategies have you used uh, and, and found useful to overcome feeling mentally fatigued, stale, and generally lacking motivation. There were a few other folk that had questions about motivation too. Yeah, I, um, I think recognising it again is really important because a lot of people will be, um, what is it, Com they're almost in their comfort zone and um, mm -hmm. other people might recognise it before you do. So I think the first thing is probably realising it and then trying to find a factor as to why it is. So is it an external factor, there's pressure from people around you, is it your environment? Um, and then once you've, you, you understand that, because there's no point, if it is your environment and then you, you know, you think, oh, I'll go out into my environment to fix it, well that's not going to work. So I think um, understanding where where the mental fatigue's coming from. I think, you know, what is, what's it, I don't want to keep quoting sayings, but if, you know, if you do the same thing, you get the same result. So <laughs> I always would think, take a risk, do something different, and try and do that outside of your normal environment. So something you've wanted to do, take on a challenge. You know, hey, oh, you wanted to learn a musical instrument? Well, do, you know, make, take steps into doing that, because I think that will, it'll, it'll appease a, a bit of that um, something in the back of your mind that you've wanted to do, but it will also put you in a, out of your comfort zone. So I'll just change the environment up. And whilst you might not 
end up, you know, you know, being in the Philharmonic Orchestra or the Australian mm. Musical Orchestra, you will have um, just given yourself a bit of a, a change up, which is which I think is really important. I, I, you know, things like uh, music for me, um, um, some reading, mm -hmm. um, reading music, reading actually Rolling Stone stuff like that, and the other thing that I I would always um, go to is um, spending because I'm an introvert probably spending time just outside in your own in your own sorry outside of that environment in your own space having a mm. power nap bit of not meditation but just spending time sort of clearing your mind that worked really well for me so a power nap is something that I actually I actually had in my training um, as a part of my um, um, training and I really found that really helped my um, my mental fatigue and my motivation, having little power naps along the way, because it just seemed to physically fire me up, but it also allowed me to sort of have a bit of a, a break in the world. You know how you, the yeah. world you're on the you're on the on the roundabout, and you just need to have a break and sort of contain your own thoughts. It almost was like a dumping for me. I'd go to an environment that I could sleep, relax, um, and I'd dump a lot of the the information overflow and all the things on my mind, and I'd come out and. And even doing the activity again, I just seemed to have a, a different mental approach and a mental attitude to that exercise once I'd had that break. And what's powerful there is that you've actually mentioned there, Steve, that you planned to re-energize through a power nap in this instance. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting with, with Frank's question. If you're feeling fatigued, whether it be mentally or physically, that's probably telling you that you need to rest. And in our fast-paced world, people can resist the need to rest when actually that just becomes a vicious cycle if you don't do it. And and we need yeah. to listen you know, to our bodies. Just on that, Gary, yeah. interesting. You've mentioned the word rest because and I probably mentioned it myself. I've changed. I don't use rest in anything anymore. I use I use even in in training and in um, programs I set for people. I call it absorption time okay. because it allows you to absorb because you're not really. I don't think you're resting. What you're doing is you're kind of you're having a break and you're stopping and, and you're you know changing things up, or you're just absorbing where you are in the world, mm -hmm. how things are. It's, got, it's like a kind of a reassessment moment. So I, I don't think you're resting. I reckon resting is the wrong word. I think we all know we understand what the outcomes will be, but don't think it's 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 not technical. I don't reckon it's resting. Well, there you go. That's just you've just explained your mental model behind the word absorption. That's beautiful. That's that's what yeah. we're trying to do, get it out there. Now, I, I am conscious of where we've got to with time, and I would like to give you an opportunity to explain to folk what you're doing right now with uh, Glow Australia. Yeah, so we I do a bit of um, uh, performance coaching and um, trying to, I suppose a lot of what I do is me talking about my life and experiences and and entertainment value, whereas I'm trying to extend that to school environment, the corporate environment, where I try to pass some, some of those life lessons and experiences on to other groups of people so that they have a positive outcome. So it's not just about me telling my story and giving some entertainment mm, value. Mm, mm. I would hope that it's making a difference to people's lives. So, and that's a lot more fulfilling for me to be in that space. And GLOW stands for something. Guidance, learning, optimism, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of, I suppose, our, you know, we, we talk about inner glow, not out of show, and, and starts a bit more of self-analysis, -anal looking at your own values and just where you're sitting, sitting in the world. And, you know, I, I think we probably don't, you know, we don't reflect enough, as you probably gathered from this conversation <laughs> the last 45 minutes. You know, I, I, there are a lot of things I, I think that people can do differently and in a more positive way to get some um, really good outcomes and I'm a, I'm a really, whilst I'm an introvert I'm a, and used to think I'm pessimistic, I'm, I'm sensing and I'm actually a really positive person and I give a lot of faith and um, I, I really enjoy seeing people develop mm -hmm. and use their abilities to allow us to live in a better community and I think we underestimate how important human nature and how in control we are of human nature and what a difference we can make to um, to the people around us. Absolutely. Uh, we can 
without any doubt. And for a lot of folk listening in here, you know, I do know a lot of the, the the folk who have joined us, and I know they contribute to their communities, whether that be through junior sport coaching or through uh, community organisations and charities. And they they give of themselves and they give of their time, and it's all about uh, trying to create that little you know, that that world that. Uh, you know, a bit, as a better place and building community, literally one person at a time, and and often, you know, a lot of folk I know that are joining joined us today, you know, do a lot of work um, in various forms with children, um, and you know, it's some children grow up in homes where there might not be a lot of guidance, learning, and optimism available, but uh, they can get it through good people giving of themselves to their community, and and you just never know the influence a single human being can have over another person. Uh, who might be doing it a bit tough, and um, just that that uh, conversation, that example as well, uh, the good manners, simple things like that. I, I'm actually an under-15 cricket coach, and it just delights me at the end of training or at the end of a game when the boys come up, and the vast majority of the boys in my squad do. They come up and just say, thank you, Gary, thank you for the time, and they say thank you to the scorers, etc. And that's just great that they've got those basic values to do that, and they're learning that from the people and the adults that they're working with. Um, I'll just give an opportunity, folk. Did you want to make a comment on that at all, Steve? No, just a, a quick example. And I was I was up at a, a run out of Robinvale, just over the New South Wales border, at a place called Houston, uh, not Houston, America, Houston, <laughs> just in New South Wales. And I went I went to school just to encourage them to um, you know to get involved in this run. And and I we taught someone who introduced me, like you, Gary, said, oh, you know, this guy's one of the most talented. People you know is ever going to come to use all this. It was all about me, and then I sort of thought, "Oh, that's interesting." I said, "Oh, any you kid? This was primary school. I had about fifty kids sitting in the courtyard, and I said, oh, any you know, you go. We're all talented. You know, you know, anyone here talented?'" And it just so happened that they'd had this sort of, you know, Houston's got talent thing at the school. This one kid got up, and and he was pretty, he was an extrovert, no doubt, and he showed me his talent. <laughs> and the next kid got up. And before, we, you know, I was there about an hour, you know, 90% of the class had got up and showed me some time. Oh, wow. And it was a little thing. And mate, I come out of there thinking, in Houston, out in the middle of nowhere, and these kids were just so positive. I'm thinking, what a great experience. And I came out of there feeling so, so enthusiastic and so delighted that these, these kids were our future. And they've got so much um, positive energy and they were so engaged, it was just unbelievable. And, it's, you know, it was all about me going in, doing them a service, and I came out thinking, yeah. Those kids have done me a service. Absolutely. And you know what I love about that story too, Steve, is the first kid, and, and this is, I think is a big leadership lesson for people, that the result was 90% of kids got up and showed you there's talent. But, you know, if the first kid didn't do it, you just wonder whether whether it would have ended up happening. And that, that courage to be the first, which is often a leadership attribute, that, that courage to, to take a risk and be vulnerable, to stand up, but the ripple effect of that from an optimistic point of view, can just be amazing, and 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 often these, you know, that kid might not have realised that that was a ripple effect that that he or she had made to the rest of that uh, school group. So, you know, that's just a wonderful story that illustrates the power and the importance of, in this case, being a leader in a moment. And I'd call them leadership moments. But that kid was a yeah. was a leader just for a moment, but the ripple effect was just so huge that someone like you's walked away feeling just awesome. How cool is that? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I'll just give folk a, an opportunity, if there are. I know we have gone a little bit over time, but people aren't dropping off, so I'm assuming they're, they're pretty happy to keep talking, and uh, we, we probably shouldn't go too long. But if there's any extra questions that we haven't answered that folk would like to ask, here's a quick opportunity to type them in, and uh, we'll give Steve a moment to do that. And uh, if you didn't see it, I should while you're just thinking about that, if you didn't see it, uh, you can go to www.glowaustralia, all one word, .com .au if you would like to engage Steve and the team at Glow Australia to uh, come out and do some work with your organisation. So we'll give you that opportunity. So again, if there's any folk that have got some extra questions that we haven't answered, uh, feel free to type them in. I'm just scanning through the list here at the moment. It's looking... People may be madly typing away. I did notice a couple of um, what would I do differently if I had my life over again. I'll tell you what I would do. I'd take more pictures. Uh, and ah. I'd, I'd get my, get a, a mother or a father who had fast twitch fibres rather than all those slow twitch fibres that have made me a marathon runner. I don't know if I can pick my mum and dad, but that would be handy. It would have been a sprinter rather than a marathon runner. 
Well, um, you know, at the pace that, of which I have run my marathon, Steve, I have managed to take a camera around with me and take photos. So, uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, in fact, when I was doing the New York Marathon, um, we, you only dip into the Bronx for a very short period of time. It's probably the only time in my life I will go into the Bronx. It was literally 600 metres or so. And there was this guy with this massive beatbox set up. And as I was going past, I turned my camera on, and this guy goes with his beatbox music in the background. Hi, y'all. Welcome to the Bronx. And I managed to capture that video footage on my little camera while I was running. But I suspect he, he was actually in focus with my running. I suspect if you were running by with the camera, he wouldn't have been in focus because you would have been going twice as fast as me. <laughs> so What a tactic that would be though. Imagine being in the Olympic marathon and you're at 35k and it's getting pretty serious and you, I just grabbed a little Instamatic camera out of my pocket and started taking photos. My God, the, the Africans and the people around me would get blown away by that. That might be a good tactic. It might create yes. They have to be affected by that. When I say about changing it up, that you couldn't get any more change up than that. Yes, Steve, that might create some mental fatigue for your competitors. Now, Chris, yeah, has, say so. Chris has actually asked, um, how do you go coping with work, family, sport balance? It's tough to keep it all in balance. Yeah, I, and that's I think that's one thing I've I've been able to do pretty well. I, you know, I've stayed in Ballarat, four kids and what, and I tend to try to. Um, it's interesting. Whilst I and a lot of people will involve themselves in in other family members or friends' activities, what I what I often say is that they do that with a little bit of a and not real attention. They'll kind of go, oh, I'm doing it to keep my kids happy. What I say is. I, I get in that moment, and I I get a bit of a benefit out of my out of it myself. So, you know, I, I might miss a second run, or used to miss a second run because does Matthew wanted to go for a bike ride. Well, what I'd go, I'd go for the bike ride, and then then I'd say, well, you know, hey, I'm getting a bit of cross training while I'm doing that. Hey, he thinks it's all about him, but hey, That's I'm right. actually enjoying this and getting a benefit out of it myself. So, I tend to to think of the situation, and you'll do it a lot more. Or willingly, if there's a bit of um, benefit for you as well. So, I get the kids. The kids come to a lot of um, my activities now. So whilst we're away, you know, I'll I'll be off at running events. The family comes along and they have a good time and enjoy it. And I sort of flit in and out of that enjoyment factor to do the job that I've got to do. But when I'm within their space, I really unwind, relax, and make sure I'm in the moment. So mm. I think that's a really important thing. You can talk about life balance as if it's, oh, I don't really want to talk about life balance because I don't want to fit in. You know, I want to be a workaholic. I don't really want to, but I have to go and spend time with my kids. I have to go. Don't have that attitude. Embrace it and, and sort of see the benefits. In, if it's work, that, if you're a workaholic, well, think of the sort of little work benefits that you're getting while you're recreating or while you're playing, doing some other activity with mm. family and friends. And about being in the moment, that as you said. Change answer? No, no, not at all. I reckon that works pretty well. Interestingly, I'm pretty honest, I don't mess around. <laughs> well, Steve, that also goes way back to your very opening comments about ad adapting. I mean, your little story there about being on the bike ride instead of going for your run, where well, you're adapting and saying, yep. well, that's actually a form of cross-training for me. I mean, that's, that's reinforcing the very initial mes message that you had about being able to develop that skill to adapt. And it, it, when you get this, you can do that to help you with life balance. And you know, one of the things I, I tend to do with, for, for folk, because I do have a program where, where they get to determine what life balance means for them, is that, they are, they, that life balance shouldn't be judged over a day, a week, or a month. It, it's best to judge it over a year so that you're, you're not feeling under pressure to try yep. and cram life balance into a day, because that's just not going to work. But tied into that is that concept you just shared then about being present and being in the moment with whatever you're doing. So if you're with your kids, you're with your kids. That doesn't mean you can't be getting cross-training benefits <laughs> because you yeah, can be. exactly. Well, I think, again, it also I just thought it, it, it sometimes it's kind of the, it's the emotional baggage that you bring to life balance. If you see it practically, if you actually work out your life balance and you go a few hours, time management, all that sort of stuff, if you do it, in a in a sort of cold hard way, it's not hard to fit it in. It's the emotional baggage that you bring with it. That, <laughs> you know, you're sitting with your kids at a park bench and they're on the playground, and and you're kind of going, oh shit, I could be back in the office. I really need to fix that up. 
that's that emotional baggage that you bring. Whereas if you, if you just take that emotion out and you go, here I am at the park, it's a beautiful day, my kids are fine, I'm relaxing, I'm, I'm breathing in good fresh oxygen, I'm having a good time, that's a fine, that's a really clear and um, brutally honest great experience. But if you bring, if you override that with, with emotion, it'll cloud the enjoyment of that experience and the focus that you can get at that time. Mm. So I reckon emotion clouds reality sometimes and in life balance, I think that's an important factor. And look, in fact, again, what you've said there, Steve, it, it, it sounds connected to your concept of the absorption time too, that I'm absorbing this moment with my kids. I might be sitting on a park bench, they're playing in the playground, but I'm absorbing this moment because I'm not, I'm not letting the emotion get in the road about these you know, three phone calls that uh, I know are waiting for me back in the office. And, and, you know, people have more control over this than I believe they recognise. Far more control. And that we can... Yeah. yeah. Um, and now, we're just highlighting it for them. Probably, there, Hopefully there's people out there nodding, going, yeah, I understand what they're talking about. Hey, you know, I sort of do that and I probably don't focus on it as much as what I could. Absolutely. Now, we, we have... Uh, reached the end of our time here and I do need to thank you Steve for, cause, for giving up your precious time and giving us some focus and you know some of the things I, I probably would like to give you a little bit more of an opportunity to talk about one of one of three key messages that I think I've heard you talk about so the first one was that that you've never done anything in a race that you didn't do in training which includes how you manage your motivation and how you've learned to adapt you, you've said that you surrounded yourself with good people um, but you ensure that you make the final decision. That's part of leadership. Um, yep. there, there is probably a third element there about leadership um, is developed, not being born. I'd like to just give you a little bit more of a, uh, a moment just to talk about that, please. Yeah, and and I, I think it's um, I, I wasn't I wasn't born a leader, but um, by it being forced upon me, I've needed to analyse myself, look inside, and be a lot comfortable within myself so that I can then go out and take on those leadership roles. So I, I'm, I'm, I have absolutely no doubt that it's a developed trait. And the way it develops is it's obvious because there's, there's so many leaders. We, don't all, we aren't all born with the same abilities and yet we all end up being leaders in some capacity. So what it says to me, it's actually not the traits it's the way that you work those um, mm. abilities that you've got. So it's, it's less, it's less I, I don't look at a grab bag, so leadership isn't a grab bag of traits that people have. It's the way that they operate. And, and the reason I say that is because everybody can do that. So whilst it might not put you in a leadership position, you know, it might not be the Prime Minister of Australia, you, you can lead yourself and you can lead the team oh. that you're a part of because it's actually a process, it's not the actual um, it's not the what is it, I'm trying to say. It's not the recipe. Mm. It's not. Oh, sorry. It's not the ingredients. It's the recipe that's the really important thing. Yeah, in and leadership. And I, I'm realizing that the more I'm involved in in leadership groups and positions and talking to people about leadership. And just with your own four children, you will have seen it, no doubt. Because as much as they're your four children, it's a, it's it's amazing how different they are, a to you and to each other, no doubt. But each of them have got leadership in their own way. I'm sure you've you've experienced that. Yeah, and even more so because of who I am and who we are, they need to have their own identity yes. and lead in, a, in, a, in, a, in in their own way rather than being led by, by their dad or their name or their reputation. Absolutely. And um, you know, that's a great message about leadership's developed, not born. And I really, I, I couldn't agree with you anymore that, that you know, no doubt some people are born with some attributes that, that will incline them towards leadership, but that doesn't mean any, you know, it is one of the things that I think anybody can do um, by tapping in and, and focusing on the recipes and using their attributes to, to work together with them. So thanks again, Steve, for your time. We really, really Please appreciate really it. enjoyed it. Um, Thanks, Gary, and thanks for the um, input from everyone. It's been very um, thought-provoking. I've enjoyed it immensely. Oh, the, look, really, I mean, that's one of the great values uh, of this system is that we can um, enable people to contribute their questions as they have done so today. Um, it, I will be posting this video of our webinar today uh, on my blog at planforpersonalsuccess.com slash blog. So please go there, and you can sign up to get uh, each of those messages sent directly to your email inbox. Thank you everyone for participating and for your time. You've got some more contact details there for me, for Gary Ryan from Organisation
conversations that matter. Once again, uh, people are sending through their great thanks to you, Steve, for your time, uh, and we know how precious it, precious it is, and I can guarantee you that I will uh, be making contact with you um, next time I'm up Ballarat Way. 